Okay. Right, everyone? Um, I see. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I say to everyone, good morning, but I'm going to say good morning again. And uh, welcome. I'm glad that you uh, wanted to, came, to come for some more about the Silk Road. Um, as we discussed, in the last time, um, the Silk Road closed, but not quite. So I want to go in what I call the second part of the history of the Silk Road. And I want to take you also traveling through the places and the people that have inhabited the Silk Road today. So um, as we talked, said earlier on, the Silk Road was the first superhighway linking China and Japan to Europe across Central Asia from ancient times by caravans and bazaars. And the Silk Road uh, brought together major technical and cultural exchange between East and West. But uh, that amazing Silk Road that happened because the Han Emperor wanted the heavenly horses and the heavenly horses could only be paid in something as precious as silk created a long, long, long process and a major exchange that came to an end in 1453, when Const Constantinople, as it was known in those days, which is Istanbul today, fall into the hands of Mehmed II, who was probably one of the first big leaders of the Ottomans. So the Ottoman Empire was established and what you've been until there, a Christian kingdom. And that brought the end of the road for the Silk Road. They just blocked that part is what we call Turkey now. So the, the goods couldn't go beyond or couldn't arrive there. So that was the end of 1500 years of an amazing exchange. I want to show you here in, that, in this map what actually happened. You see that area that I have obscured on purpose where the arrows are? That is the area that suddenly was blocked. So the two stars mark beginning of end of this road. And obviously it was a block. You couldn't go any further. That was the end of the, the end of the Silk Road. There were some intents to try to bring, you know, from the north, you see there where the, where the star is and where it would be Venice uh, in Italy, coming all the way down to Egypt, from Egypt going across Suez, the canal didn't exist in those days, going around the Arabian Peninsula, Peninsula or crossing the Syrian desert. They also tried going over the Alps into what we call today Eastern Europe and, in, and what it is today Russia, but it didn't work because you didn't have the infrastructure. Remember, we were talking about what the most important thing that you did for any caravan to, to make, to bring the goods, is you needed a caravan serai, which was the place where you could store your goods, where you would find safety, where you could find a place to heal, where you could bring all the goods. You also, in the caravan serai, you were going to find the guys who knew how to take you on the other parts of the, of the journey. And you were going to employ the security teams that will keep you safe in those lands which you didn't know. So you didn't have the infrastructure in those places. And, of course, you also didn't have the bazaars where you could do the trade, where you could sell the goods and buy new ones. So those trials around didn't work. But we had two empires that for 1500 years they've been trading with each other, two parts of the world, east and west. 1500 years of training, more than seven kilometers of route. And there were millions of people employed in the trade and the infrastructure of the Silk Road. Also many goods vital to everyday life like spices, medicine, etc. suddenly they were blocked. There were no possibility to take them from one way to another. So <laughs> this couldn't just come to an end, right? New ways had to be found around it. And you probably remember that we talked about the great invention, the great discoveries that were being brought from the East to the West. Very important, paper and the printing press. The paper and printing press suddenly allowed books to be made and uh, printed cheaper. Books become democratic information. 
got democratized, which means before the, inform the, the, the culture was in the hands of the church. They were the only ones who could, who had the workforce to write those books by hand. They will be writing vellum, which was very, very expensive. So a book in itself was a terribly expensive center. Only the libraries or the monasteries or the aristocrats could own. But now suddenly books were much, much cheaper. Middle class had access to knowledge knowledge that had been probably lost to the humanity for a long time. They went back to the works of Socrates, to the works of Aristoteles, to the works of Pythagoras, you know, great, great uh, mathematicians and geometricians. And all this knowledge in, and information brought what was called the rebirth of learning, the renaissance, the rebirth. And that expanded it, it expanded in many different ways. As the church suddenly lost its central power, people also could read the, the Bible, the moment that the Bible was printed, and they had another interpretation of it, which that brought the reformation, it brought the division of the church, which means the church was not just the only one with only one power in Europe, but it went beyond that. It went into art, they went into this cavern, went into people applying themselves. It was a very, very exciting time in Europe. Mostly it was I started in the northern Italian states. There, it was not Italy at the time, but there were city kingdoms, so the is Florence, as we know, and Venice, and they moved all around for the rest of Europe. And that meant a, a, a it was the starting of great discoveries and inventions. Um, for instance, the inventions that may see exploration successful. In the 1450, a new design of boats, more efficient and with improved rigging, was created, the caravel. At the same time, um, if you remember, we were talking about the compass and gunpowder. The compass and gunpowder made those ships more uh, be able to be protected and at the same time able to travel further than the coast. Better instruments, gunpowder prote uh, protection, and that takes us to the story of the understanding of the well, uh, of, of the seas at the time. According to the church, the seas, the, the, the earth was flat. If you went to an edge, to the end of the egg or to the end of the earth and you were beyond that you were going to fall off the cliff or if you made it uh, be, 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 without falling off the cliff you were going to find all these incredible sea monsters as you can see there so that was the understanding of sea travel at the time but with the renaissance other, other elements came into that. And that was very much, very much pushed from the Iberian Peninsula. On the corner there, we have Enrique the Navegante, Enrique the Seafarer. He was the king of Portugal. He had tremendous interest in sea traveling. And he really was the earliest one who started traveling beyond the Mediterranean, to travel on the Atlantic coast and going beyond seeing the coast itself right so that was tremendously important but at the same time other things were happening in what we call today are spain for many years spain for hundreds of years is being in the hands of the moorish the arabs from north africa for many years they've been trying to push them out and it was at, in the 1400s that two kings got together. That was really a marriage made in heaven. Um, uh, Isabel of Castilla and Fernando of Aragon. Isabel was a very, very strong queen. She was a queen on her own. In fact, Castilla was bigger than Aragon. She was the kind of woman who would put armor on a sword and go fighting with her people. And the two of them eventually managed to push the Moors out of Spain. And they established themselves in what it is, the Alhambra which was the Palace of the Moors, probably one of the most beautiful buildings you are going to find in Spain. And I really recommend it, that you go to see the Alhambra and the Generalife. Anyway, they managed, they, they established themselves. Now they got the, the, the country that we call Spain. It was not called Spain yet, free. But they were 
poor as mice. They were completely bankrupt. On the other hand, we have a Genoese uh, captain who had been going around the, court, the courts of Europe peddling this idea that the earth was not flat, that the earth was round. Of course, nobody believed in that, but the kings of Aragon and Castilla, they were so desperate that they felt, oh well, why not try these crazy schemes? With very little money, money that they had to borrow, uh, the finances, very small expedition, only three caravels, which was manned by prisoners of the jails. And in 1492, from the Puerto de Palos in south of Spain, they left on the road to prove that there was not an edge to the world, but that the world was round. And the idea was that if you start in one point and you draw and you went all around, eventually you were going to come to the famous Indies. And so there he left from, I can see South Spain on the way to the West to eventually come to the Indies. What was the Indies? Well, the Indies at the time was everything that was in, in the East. Uh, it was India, of course. It was Indochina. It was Indonesia. It was the coast of China, the Spice Islands. All that was the Indies. So there he went on his trip and within three months, um, he found land. Okay, he didn't realize that he actually had found the whole continent in between Europe and the Indies. And that is when Europeans discovered the big continent that today we call the Americas. Of course, he didn't know that at the time. And in fact, he arrived at what we call Cuba today, that he called La Española, now I can... and he claimed yeah. <laughs> and we claim, and he claimed those lands for the crown of Spain. <laughs> Hola, nice to see you. Well, nice to know that you're there, Ursula. Welcome. Uh, we are just telling the guys why when um, the, the one door were closed from the, from the Silk Road, people went looking for other ways to make it to the Indies. So uh, Cristobal Colón made it, he thought he had made it to the Indies, uh, to the point that today in the Spanish language, when you talk about the indigenous people of the Americas, they are called Indios. Um, um, we, you know, they, and they call the people from India Hindus. Right, so he thought he had right to the Indies, he hadn't, as we know now, but that was not the most important thing. The important thing is that they have proven, it's been proven that the earth was not flat, it was round. It was tremendously important. And the whole story of what happened in the Indies, in the, in, in, in the Americas, sorry, and the Aztecs and the Incas and all that is a whole new, it's a whole another story that I think somewhere we should pursue because it's fascinating. Anyway, let's go back to the Silk Road. So now we know that the earth was round and we knew that if you started from one side, you eventually were going to end up on the, on the same point. That was a revolutionary, probably one of the most um, mind-breaking uh, news uh, that they were brought to the courts of Europe, which means everybody else jumped into it. There were all kind of different great, great adventurers that went there to discover, uh, discover for Europe because they didn't know about these places, and started mapping the world. There are just some names, the Champlain, Magellan. Magellan was the one who went all the way down um, uh, South America and he came into the Pacific, Cartier, Vespucho, Diaz. Diaz very close to us in South Africa because we know he was the one who went around Africa and, um, and, and made um, a stop in South Africa and what we call today Durban, Natal. Cook yeah. later on who went to Australia. So this was a tremendous, exciting time. But what becomes important for us is that all these boats left from Europe find a new route. And it's one route that for us is very important. And that is the one that going around Africa, you can see the arrows there, take us to the Indies and establish eventually contact to the end of the Sur Road that we have lost. That was terribly, terribly important. And as we can see here, um, contact was reestablished with it. 
the mostly uh, the people who did it, the, the, the ones who started were the Portuguese um, who will create uh, the colony of Macau. And, uh, and then also the uh, Dutch who created colonies in what we call today Indonesia, which was called all Batavia for there. And they also established contact with Japan. Japan has stayed very much separated from the rest of the world until then. So we reestablish contact. The Silk Road exists again uh, with different points. Sometimes, uh, as you can see there, um, some of them went direct to India. And from India, they, that's where it was, Goa. Goa and, and from India, they will go up into Kashmir and, and join the Silk Road that that we knew we knew before. Other ones go direct to the end of uh, by China and come from that end. And the roads that existed, the land roads, still exist. It was just that part from Samarkand to Byzantium to Istanbul that has been closed. <clears throat> so, and a matter of about 50, 80 years, the Silk Road was going as strong again. And um, <clears throat> We, going back now to what it was exchanged in the Silk Road. You remember what I told you on the first part, that because the costs were very expensive, the overheads were very expensive, and a lot of um, <clears throat> goods were lost in one way or another, yeah. you know, um, caravans were lost in the sun, or they were robbed anyway. So only very luxurious goods were worth it. So, and the second trading of the Silk Road, we have silk, of course, we have spices, of course, we had the very expensive dyes, and all this was financed because Europe suddenly had all that gold that they were bringing from the Americas. That brought a tremendous injection to the, to the economy of Europe. They had a lot of money to build, to fight wars, but also to buy. And the Europeans have developed an incredible taste for two special things. The fancy porcelains of China and Japan and tea. Tea was going to actually create wars. Tea was the most, the, the fanciest, most important good that was happening at that time. But you must understand that this, a lot of that was done by boat. A lot of those boats went through storms. A lot of both those boats got wet. What happened? A lot of the time, the cargo got wet. The tea was very expensive. So when the tea got wet, they were not throwing it away. The tea got wet, the tea uh, um, fermented. It went black and fermented. And so uh, that's the tea that the people in Europe was, were sold. So that's the tea that they knew. Um, what, that's why today we talk about black tea. In reality, fermented tea is not what tea should be. So much so that now the tea is obviously uh, grown properly and, and, and harvested properly. What they have to do is they have to ferment it. So we are happy because that is our idea of tea. Of course, in the East, they drink what it is, green tea. Um, probably tea as is supposed to be. Nevertheless, that's a little thing about tea. Tea was terribly important, but tea was also very expensive. And the Chinese was, when they saw what the, the goods that the Europeans were bringing, uh, so no, all these are shoddy goods, your textiles don't come to us, this is not, not really, we don't want. If you want tea, you have to pay us for that, right? So we want silver or gold for the tea. Well, there was a problem because um, you had to find ways to pay for the tea. There was only one thing at the time that was very valuable uh, that the English had that they could exchange or they could create a lot of money for, and that was opium. Opium was um, cultivated in Afghanistan and for hundreds of years it had been exported, what it was called the tears of the opium, uh, which is, um, as you can see there, as uh, once the the, the leaves of the flower have fallen, cuts are made, um, what are called the tears, which is a serum comes out and, uh, and that creates the paste and that is with opium. Uh, opium was used very much for medical reasons. 
they probably was you for others, but really was for medical reasons. It was the only thing you have in those days to dull pain. But the idea was if you cultivated enough opium, you could sell it, and it was very, very expensive. And the story was um, you couldn't sell it just for medical reasons. So um, what they did is they brought opium and they started planting it in North India, in Patna, and the uh, foothills of the Himalayas. And you can see there is a drawing of the huge warehouses in India and um, run by the British. And all those that looks like rolls, that looks like bread, in reality are cakes of opium. And that opium was a smuggle into China. That way, uh, they could get silver. Yeah. That created a very big problem. A very, very big problem. Yeah. Because it brought drug addiction into China and into what we know today as Vietnam and all that part of the East. As you can imagine, uh, the people from the East, the governments of the East, were most upset about it. And I say, no, you cannot bring opium into, into our lands. I mean, it's the same that Europe and America and all that is saying, you cannot bring drugs into our land. Um, that brings to a, a, not a, a very unsavory part of, 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 the history, of our history, especially the history of the West. When they were told, no, you cannot carry on smuggling this opium, you are creating a huge, uh, a huge addiction in our countries. We come into what's called the Opium Wars. The Opium Wars were the countries of the West fought against the countries of the East in the name of free trade to bring opium, to sell opium in, this, in these countries. Um, as you can see there, um, it's, um, the opium, opium imports into China, uh, that is um, a document from the United Nations office. The usage of opium until 1800, it was well below the 1000 metric tons. It was used for medicine. Once the, in the name of free trade opium was brought into China, you can see it went to close to 7,000 7, metric tons. It was very bad. The opium wars, there were two opium wars. China in those days was in very bad shape. Um, they were very divided. They have uh, poor leadership. China lost both opium wars. And the countries of the West established themselves in what they were called the treaty ports. Um, means those, as you can see, there are two paintings there about the opium wars. It's, it's actually incredible to think today that um, countries, official governments, the people of their country supporting it for the right to sell what the people of those countries didn't want to buy. Um, I find that a little bit upsetting. And on top of that, you can see even a gold coin was made uh, when the Chinese lost the war and they had to uh, accept what we were called the treaty ports, where the ports where the West could sell whatever they wanted in the, yeah. in the coast of China and what it is Hong Kong, Macau, etc. Not, not one of the best parts of our history. So uh, that eventually will come to an end with the revolution in 1947, when um, uh, the Communist Party won and they kicked out all the all these um, treaty ports were closed, and all the foreigners who were pushing the goods um, had to leave. Um, uh, this has got nothing to do. I'm not talking about how good or how right was the communist um, party or the communist government, but uh, all I'm saying is only by the middle of the 20th century, these countries could reassert uh, their autonomy in in their own land. But of course, not everything was bad. At the same time in Europe, uh, the Industrial Revolution was happening. And that was going to change the world as we knew it. Suddenly, we could make a lot of goods at a very fast rate and at a much cheaper price. Of course, we know that uh, the, revol the Industrial Revolution was not uh, done in the best of morals, um, moral world. Uh, you can see children were used to it, all kinds of things were done, 
all kind of things of when we talk pollution and all that, we will have, you know, we will have a better way look at it. It was tremendously, tremendously important. And a lot of things, a lot of new technology was going to be developed from the car to the steam engine to the machine that will put textiles, arms, uh, communications, sound, the telegraph. It was an incredible and incredible revolution. It was going to change the way we ourselves lived. Uh, and machines were starting to be doing things for us. And it was going to completely change transport. Tremendously, tremendously important. So a lot of that new technology now started moving from the west to the east. Remember at the beginning, it had been mostly from the east to the west, those ancient civilization with much more knowledge. Now all that information, all that knowledge, and a matter of three, 400 years were converted into something else. And the industrial revolution were going to flourish. And all that new technology was going to be moved from the West to the East, to the point that these days, the West is the provider of not only just uh, technology, but all the luxuries on the East. And I will say the trade has become very, very big. So much so that a lot of the luxury brands actually they produce for the East only. At the same time, the fact that traveling has become much cheaper with all those inventions that started at the time of the Industrial Revolution, it means that a lot of goods that are made in the East and not just luxury goods any longer are coming to the West from computers and cell phones to clothing to food. So the communication from East to West are becoming a single routine of every day. The Silk Road now is huge. It's just happening all the time and it's happening in many different ways. But the fast and easy communication is a two-sided, shall we say, because there are good things happening. Uh, penicillins and vaccines have moved from one side to another, but also things like syphilis, the plague, coronavirus, cholera, all these pandemics are shared these days by East and West. As traveling, as I say, is cheap, it's fast, and it becomes practically impossible to contain the pandemic from one side to another. I remember in the 1350, the huge, pan the huge plague pandemic came from the East to the West and more than 50 people died altogether. Well, in the 1700, the plague was brought at this time from Europe to the East. So, and we have the problem with coronavirus now. So one of the things that happened is the fastest, the quicker communication becomes, more difficult also it is to block the problem that go with it. I want to talk to you about something that most people don't know, and it's probably one of the most exciting things that are happening about the Silk Road. It's called the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. It's probably as uh, so the most well-known um, China project, the Belt and Road Initiative, is one of the most ambitious undertakings in human history. The biblical, biblical side trade and infrastructure endeavor will be the 21st century Silk Road. This, this Silk Road has been, um, in fact, a lot of that is already happening. It will cover all the places of the old Silk Road with a few other ones add to it that were not part of the original Silk Road, and it will take, it will go all the way to Rotterdam. Will be as a connection, as a net of different roads connected that will cross some of the most difficult places. You know, later I will show you when I show you about the places of the Silk Road, and it will take from one end of Asia to the other end of Europe. It's going to be amazing. They're going to be um, uh, subsidiaries, you know. It will go, for instance, it will go um, to certain parts of Africa. It will go to the south of Europe, too. It's amazing. It is uh, It's very much happening. It's, it is built. I had the privilege to do some of that on the Karakorum Highway, which is the part that connects um, uh, from Pakistan into over 
India and taking us uh, beyond that into 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 Tibet and and further. And it is amazing. It's an incredible endeavor when it is ready. But then, of course, there are people who say that this Belt and Road Initiative is a double-sided tool. And of course it is. It is because um, there is gonna be export and it's a way to push the things. Many people say that this is what the red dragon, the Chinese dragon is creating this, is putting so much um, effort in this because it will be the way to push its ex effort, its experts all the way into Europe. And, and that not only will be China, it will be Korea, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Japan, India. Yes, it is true. Of course, it will be an, an probably an easier and cheaper way to bring the, to, to export for any of those countries, but it works both ways, right? And um, if we could fight war for free trade, I think what is nice these days is we don't do that anymore. We do fight other kind of war. We were uh, economic wars. But I believe that um, this uh, big road that will connect in one go, one end to the other, is going to be terribly important because we know that when goods travel, it's not only goods that travel, it's ideas, it's information, it's religion, it's art. It happened for 1,500 years before and it's happening now. When humans get into contact with each other, there is always an exchange that is beyond the financial exchange. And so I want to talk to you about traveling now in the 21st century along the Silk Road. What happens if you start if you pick up a bag and you say, right, I'm gonna follow on the footsteps of Marco Polo, I'm gonna follow on the footsteps of even singing, I want to go where they went. What am I going to find? What is gonna happen? So um, I'm going to show you here uh, in the map that you can see there, uh, that is what it was, the old road, as it happened before it was closed by the Ottomans. Um, it is amazing. As obviously, it's not something that you're gonna do in one trip. I've been doing it in a small part, in small pieces. Um, fortunately, this May, in May, I was doing the Caucasus, which has been postponed, not cancelled, postponed. And, uh, and I've been doing it through, probably through the last 20 years. Some places are so nice that I go back many, many times. Some places have been closed now, like Afghanistan, unfortunately. But, um, I think it is a wonderful adventure and you can decide which part do you want to do. So I'm going to show you a little bit what happened if you, if, if you do that. Well, of course, we're going to leave from Istanbul, right? Istanbul is the capital of Turkey. It's very much open today. And Istanbul, there you got the beautiful Galata Bridge that connects East and West, connects Europe to Asia. It's a tremendous cosmopolitan city where you find things just that talks about this history of hundreds of hundreds of thousands of years, you know, here from Hagia Sophia to the, to the most modern uh, buildings on the other side, on the Galata side, amazing, amazing food. It's a place to go and spend time and just have a, have a coffee on the side, have an, an apple tea, have something to eat, watch the people, because um, I find that there is, wonderful it's one of those cities where you got the perfect climate to people watch and definitely to eat the food is brilliant but if we go beyond let me get you don't want to see me if you go beyond um, Istanbul the caravans went through Cappadocia. Cappadocia got the most incredible geographic features, those which are called the fairy chimneys. Um, it's, it's erosion on a very soft uh, loaf of stone that had created these places. It's a very, very old part of the world. We are talking about where the world, the history of our world started, right? Um, for instance, in the bottom there, there are the, the um, ruins of Ma Mount Nemrut. Nemrut was one of the biblical kings, and these um, uh, ruins have been excavated just a while ago. And uh, 
but um, Cappadocia is a plateau which is extremely, extremely nice and, uh, and it got a history that goes thousands of years. The people are found uh, very special. They are what we call the Turk commands, some of the ones who moved in the very early days of the Silk Road. And, uh, and still there is a lot of um, handmade goods who attest for the tradition of, of, of their culture. So from um, Cappadocia, we were gonna move into <laughs> the north, uh, into the border, of, uh, the border of Turkey. Again, you can see those amazing formations, uh, the people themselves. I wanted to put a little bit of everything that happened there. Yes, they, they, um, you're gonna see a lot of um, sheep and goats, which of course they use very much for the beautiful carpet that they make. And so beyond there, we get into the Caucasus. When you uh, cross the border of uh, Turkey and to will be the Caucasus countries are Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Um, very important, of course, Mount Ararat. Have you heard Noah's Ark? Well, Noah's Ark is supposed to have landed on the top of Mount Ararat. That's very beautiful. And um, it's an area which is very rich in mountains and water. And, and you got some of the oldest monasteries and churches. Um, people, most people don't know that actually Armenia is uh, the first country that declared itself Christian much before Italy, much before uh, all the others. And of course, we are talking about the Christianity or what today is called the Orthodox Church. And it's very, very much alive there. In fact, the Orthodox Church is also very much alive in Georgia. And um, as you can see there, I was talking to you about those, um, those beautiful monasteries, very special people and ruins uh, that in many ways we will say, oh my God, that looks like, um, you know, the little uh, Greek villages. We much understand that all that people were very connected and the style of architecture of 1,000, 1,500 years ago is still very much what you're going to find there. So um, this is, I think, probably some of my most beautiful photographs. This is in North Georgia, both are there. Um, that is a monastery and the Caucasus, the Caucasus Mountains. Uh, on the other side, we're gonna have what we call Russia. And uh, beautiful place, beautiful valleys, very nice part to go hiking. And um, they have um, a reasonable uh, long summer. So it's, um, it's a very, very good place um, if you want to go on a holiday. I'm going to be there. Um, so that was, uh, our, uh, this is Georgia and our, here I got you a couple of photographs of you or oh, the people of Georgia dressed in their traditional dresses. And I thought they were very special. I think those men are very dashing, definitely. <laughs> and you can see very much their, their Turkoman, um, their Turkoman ancestors and that part and the people from beyond the Urals. Um, so from there we go uh, to, Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is a slightly different. In Azerbaijan, which of course got a lot of oil, I brought a lot of richness, the capital Baku here. And you can see in the background, the very modern buildings that Petro had bought. And at the same time, the beautiful old buildings of old Baku. And um, here, and this, this is the, in Azerbaijan, this is the city called Serai. Serai, of course, that was one of the biggest caravan Serais of the Silk Route. And this is what is called the Palace of the Khans. The Khan, Khan is always, uh, in the Asian languages, Khan is the king or the one, the chieftain, the one who's in charge, Genghis Khan, for instance. And obviously there was a smaller Khan, uh, that was the Khan of Azerbaijan, and, uh, and it's still in very, very, very good conditions. And you can see the influence already and the decoration. Uh, from Azerbaijan, we're going to go into, um, with this um, Bukhara. Uzbekistan hold two of the most important cities of the Silk Road. Bukhara and Samarkand. Uh, here on the, on the side, you see the famous unbreachable walls of Bukhara, who, which unfortunately were nowhere unbreachable. As we know, Genghis Khan 
did breach the walls of Bukhara and did take all the people, did put all the people to the sword. But soon after that, he got very much uh, involved in rebuilding and the, the next uh, Tans did an amazing work. And by that time, that part of the world had become Muslim. So the rebuilding was very much around uh, madrasas and mosques. They use a lot of that blue, as you are going to see here, and absolutely everything. They do very, very, very good craft. They have very good, good craftsmanship. Those, those textiles that you see on the side, the yarn is dyed first, and it's dyed in such a way that when it's woven, the design comes as, as you see there, which is it's amazing. You have to know exactly how it's called an ikat. You probably have seen it in Indonesia and Malaysia. It's a very, very special technique of dyeing the yarn. Um, I want to explain you something. Uh, here you will see when we get into Samarkand. I know that it's beautiful. And um, that blue, I was talking the very, the, why the blue is so, is, is so special. Right, um, as you know, when we made dyes, and those days dyes were uh, only natural. And to create that blue, there is only one way to do it. And that is by grinding lapis lazuli. Uh, there is lapis lazuli, um, the best lapis lazuli come from Afghanistan. And only by grinding lapis lazuli, you can create that blue. That makes that blue very expensive. Therefore, that blue is reserved for everything that's sacred. And that actually um, reflects um, um, the Christian tradition too, because blue uh, eventually, you know, that dye made it to Europe. And I, again, it was horribly, horribly expensive. So it was reserved for the mantle of the Virgin. In fact, if you see for paintings of the Renaissance or the early days of Europe, the only was that blue, that lapis lazuli blue, were the 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 dye what the dye reserved for the for the mantle of the Virgin Mary. She was the one deserving of expense, and we see obviously. Um, much bigger scale in Central Asia because, of course, they were closer to, to Afghanistan and it was cheaper for them, but still it was quite expensive. So Samarkand is another of the magnificent cities of Uzbekistan and you can see the kind of decoration that we're talking there. Again, the best, it was reserved for, what if, for that, that it was sacred. And um, you can see also the beautiful ornamentation of, of the girls in there. Um, very, very beautiful people, very generous, very open. Um, they are wonderful with their guests. In fact, a guest is, is the most special per per person in, in, in their world and in their home. Um, from Samarkand, I want to show you there, right, and um, that was the old map of the Silk Road. And as you can see there, we are in Samarkand and Bukhara. On the side, you're gonna have the Pamir Mountains. So you go, you can travel, you can choose. You can go down into Balkh, uh, that is Afghanistan, and from Afghanistan into Srinagar, that is Kashmir, that will take you to India, or to Leh, et cetera, et cetera, or you can go through the top. So I'm going to show you um, if you go to Balk, Balk is in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, um, we cannot go to Afghanistan now. I, wasn't, I went in Afghanistan in the early days of the 90s. It was a, re a little bit complicated, but now, as we know, it's closed. But in those days, obviously, Afghanistan was part of it. But today, you cannot go to Afghanistan or Iraq, but you can fly over and, uh, and get into Pakistan in India or Kashmir, is that what you want? So the way to uh, the connection from uh, Afghanistan into Pakistan and India was the Khyber Pass. And this is probably one of the most romantic places. You probably have heard about all the battles in the Khyber Pass or the great expedition who made it to the Khyber Pass. The Mughals who were to conquer India, they came 
from Afghanistan by the Khyber Pass, uh, when the English had conquered that part of the world, they had the bases on the Khyber Pass. It's one, it's, it's completely amazing, those incredible mountains, and you can see in the photograph, the serpentine of the Khyber, of the Khyber Road. And uh, on some, I managed to get some old photograph there, frontier of India, of course, and those days, they call it the frontier of India, but now will be Pakistan because in those days India and Pakistan were just one country. And uh, the problem that we have today in the Khyber Pass, unfortunately, is the, the militias, um, the terrorists, and the Khyber Pass is mostly closed unless it is to trade. And then again, that can be sometimes closed for a week and you, there is a whole queue of trucks camping on the side of the road for a week or whatever, depending. The situation is terribly fluid in the Khyber Pass. But from there, you could go to the Vale of Kashmir, a most, most beautiful place, a very, very um, romantic part of the world, I would call it. So much so that for many years, Kashmir was the place to go on honeymoon. And um, um, let me move this out there so you can see. Kashmir was the place to go on honeymoon. As you can see, to be the, the mode of transport in Kashmir is the shikara. You can see some people there. And you go in, a, in Kashmir, you go and stay in a houseboat. But the houseboats are actually very special. They're exactly what they are. They are, they are boats that actually, they float, but you're, you're not gonna go anywhere in those boats. They just float on the water. Why were they created? Very simple, because in the old days, um, the foreigners could not own any land in India. So if they wanted to go to Kashmir and have a holiday, they have one of these boats built for themselves or they rented for the holidays and they lived on the boat and, uh, and they move around obviously uh, on the small shikaras or they could come into land and they use the carriages. But that way you could own a boat in the land, you could, uh, in the water, you could not own a house in the land. And the inside, they are quite incredible. The, obviously no more boats have been built from the fifties. So you walk inside there and, and inside of those boats and you live in like you would have been in the fifties, the Cretona soft sofa, the whole radio. It's actually very, very beautiful. And, and of course, Kashmir, it is a most magical land. It's, um, it's nice to go there, spend a couple of weeks, sit on the boat, have your tea with the spices, your masala chai, have the guys who come in the Chikara to sell you flowers or shawls or whatever. Um, it's a very special part of the world. My godfather was born in Kashmir. His father was a resident in the time of the British Empire. And I, I heard so many stories. So I started traveling there very early. And, um, and it's a part of the world very dear to me, which I seriously recommend to all of you. So from Kashmir, you're gonna move into Ladakh. Ladakh is what people call uh, Little Tibet. It's very much like it. In fact, um, it's, in the old days it was part of Tibet, but when China and India had uh, the, the war in the 60s, Ladakh ended up on the Indian side, so, um, and Tibet on the Chinese side, as we know. So uh, it makes traveling in Ladakh much easier. You will have less problems with visas and um, um, it's more open to from that point of view and uh, it's, it's also very nice. It's, what, it's the top of the world and what many people don't know is actually that in the Himalayan, in the Himalayas in Ladakh is where some of the biggest rivers start, the Brahmaputra, the Jansi, all of them, the Yellow River, all of them start in that part in Ladakh. And of course, it's, it's Buddhist, as I say, very much a Tibetan culture. The people are of the Tibetan ethnic group. And, um, and it's based, as I say, in and, um, and, and the Himalayas. And there are some amazing places to trek in Ladakh. I did it. Um, you had to acclimatize, of course, but I would recommend it. And, uh, and also, as for those who cannot go to Tibet, that will be a way to be to understand that culture and to be uh, probably closer to understand what, what Tibet was um, a few years ago. For those who can, then you're gonna go into Tibet. Uh, these days, um, I went into Tibet from 
uh, Nepal from Kathmandu. You go over the road and pass. But these days, I believe visas that were very difficult, and you will have to come from uh, from Beijing. There is a train uh, that will take you there. And uh, I suppose that is probably the, the easiest and more comfortable way to do it. We did it by four by four and uh, stopping all along the way, but it was a lot, a lot of fun. Um, you're gonna find uh, monasteries like this along the way. You're gonna find a lot of um, uh, people still living in the countryside. I didn't want to put a photograph of Lhasa because I think Lhasa had become probably a little bit too, uh, um, uh, commercial or to it's less of what Tibet used to be and I recommend very much that you go to see the monasteries around Lhasa and you're gonna have probably more of a, a taste of, um, of the Tibet that we like that we want to see because um, it's more um, they don't have uh, so many foreigners living in the land but if you didn't go on this way and you went above, if you went on the other side of the Pamir Mountains, this is what you are going to find. Uh, the Pamir Mountains are also, all these mountains are all uh, part of a chain. Uh, they are not as high as the Himalayas, but very close. So um, you, in between the mountains, you're gonna find the most amazing valleys. Um, the nomads who live there, they also have the same, uh, custom uh, that all the, the people of Central Asia use, which is the gear. The gear is that, that um, um, you may call it hat, in reality it's made, it's made of felt. Uh, it's a pretty strong, um, pretty, pretty strong uh, building, you know, um, that has been created with uh, felt, with very good carpets on the floor. Some of them, like that one, it's got its own chimney. Um, they use different kind of saplings to create the round form. And the, the great thing is that they can dismantle that and move to another, other pastures and take the jerk with them. With them. Um, it's something that the nomads of this part of the world not only are doing it now and not only share, something that is very much into who they are. When we were in, in Mongolia um, last year, when we were doing the Trans-Siberia, it was very interesting because we went to certain towns where the Mongolians are kind of living, they have settled and they have a house made of bricks and yet in the garden, they will have a girl. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of, yes, that is the place where we go. That's the place where we have our little party. That is the place where we stay with the family. And you can see also here, I, got a, I put a photograph of um, uh, one of the nomads traditionally dressed. And you can see that it's a little bit of mix there on what we will call, you know, the Russians and the Tibetans and the Mongols, because it's all the people actually come from this part of the world, from the Pamir Mountains. And um, you can see here, and um, very much more than times when they go, when they move, there is a, a family of about three or four nomads. And they do have also a Land Rover on the side. The Land Rover gets used when they have to go far into a city for supplies and all that. And yet they choose to live in the mountains. They choose to live there and they have their cattle in different parts and somehow they are very, very connected to the environment in which they live. They are very independent people. The women definitely are very strong. And what that usually happens uh, with the nomads and all that, everybody has to do their work. So the women are as important or more important than the men. And they have a very, I would say a very vital position in the life of the tribe of the family. So you're gonna find very strong women, the story of her there with the hand and the hip, you know, is very much, a, they are not valiant themselves. Uh, they tend to be, most of them, great riders. And they still keep a lot of the traditions like hunting with eagles or birds, which are found very, very beautiful. And they will use horses 
of Sebulius Camus. And from there, we remember we are taking the north, uh, we come to Kashgar. Kashgar is, um, is, is one of the cities that were starting to get into the border of, of the Gobi Desert. And it's very much what you see there, a great mix of Turkoman people with, with what we will call Chinese people. It's, um, it's a very, uh, it's a very old city, but as a city, it's, it's, it's not big, it's small because in reality, a lot of nomads, a lot of people live around Kashgar, but, and they come to shop in Kashgar and to buy things in the amazing market of Kashgar. But a lot of the people who buy and shop and eat in Kashgar do not live in Kashgar. Of course, there's been a great immigration of Chinese people uh, into this part of the world, and uh, but the photograph that I'm showing you there is of course what I call the old town, which is the real Kashgar for me. Very, very nice. Um, very, very uh, much in the edge of two worlds. And from there, as I told you, we were coming to the border, into the border of the, the, the desert of the Gobi you will get we will carry on traveling in the direction of the east and we are going to find Turfan or Tulpan. that is an oasis that is an oasis where the uh, the um, silk road travelers used to stop to load up and all the things they could need before they were going to go and before they were getting into the Taklamakan desert as you can see again there is a mix of cultures there. Uh, you can see the Buddhist influence from the early, from the very, very early days of the Silk Road. And at the same time, they were going to have um, uh, mosques and uh, Muslim inhabitants. But it's very mixed, it's very fluid. There is not um, a problem. Uh, there is not a issue of, um, uh, um, religious uh, strife in this part of the world. I didn't find it at all. And from the Turfan Oasis, and that we are going to get, oh, sorry, <laughs> from the Turfan Oasis, um, where the people of the Silk Road will do, prepare themselves to move their caravans through the Taklamakan. The Taklamakan is a terrible, it's one of the biggest deserts in the world. Uh, it's called the Sea of Death. As you can see, the sands of the Taklamakan, they look like a sea. And the word Taklamakan is supposed to be uh, uh, a name given in the Uhur uh, language, which is the people who live there. And it's supposed to mean you can get in, but you cannot get out. Uh, the truth is that many, many, many uh, caravans were lost in the Taklamakan. Obviously now things have changed there, there are roads and all that, but it still is terribly, terribly difficult and it's one of the most inhospitable part of the world. So what do we do today if we want to cross the Taklamakan? Right, these are contemporary photographs of it. As you can see there are very, very tiny oases, um, which of course you will be, you will find if you do, uh, if you go with maps and GPS, you can see the roads are endless, boring, um, and go on for a very long time with no change whatsoever. Of course, these days we have GPS, we have maps, and probably if you go on your own, I seriously recommend that you join a group. Uh, there are also some wonderful adventures done um, with, the, like you see there with the camels, uh, obviously not to cross the whole of the Taklamakan, but to cross part of it. And if you decide that you want to do the Taklamakan, I seriously recommend that book that is called Conquering the Desert of Death, Across the Taklamakan by Charles Blackmore. As it's a very it's a very interesting book, even if you don't want to do the the Takla, the, the Takla Makan. And uh, if you decide to do it, I recommend that you do it. I would read that book 
and that you probably use some of the groups. S. Taclamacan, S. definitely not for CCs. So through the Taclamacan and the border of the Taclamacan, you're going to come to the caves of Tudongwang, or what is called the Cave of the Southern Buddhas. This is probably one of the most incredible, biggest complex that you are going to find in what we call China, uh, one of the biggest archaeological complex. This was built, obviously, um, at the end of um, the six, 600 to 800. From the outside, as you can see in the corner, they look just like ugly caves. But inside, you are going to find some of the most incredible frescoes and sculptures um, that have been ever created. If you probably look, you are going to see in, in, the, in the top corner that shows it quite well, the face of the Buddha, you can see the influence, the Greco-Roman influence on the carvings of those faces, because those were the times where the influence of the art, of the Greco-Roman art along the Sur Road was terribly, terribly important. And a lot as well, some of the frescoes will have what we call the typically Chinese features, you are going to find in a lot of them the Greco-Roman influence that it actually came from Afghanistan that in those days was also Buddhist, not Muslims. The cave of the South in Buddha is one of the most amazing things that you're going to find in China. You can take a train from Xi'an to go there and I really, really recommend it. As, especially on the the feeling in it, but also the art they're going to find there. And that will take us, we are in the Gobi, as you remember, the desert of the Gobi, and that will bring us eventually what I will call it more civilization. And as we get into the, oh, sorry, I want to move the, I want to make this small. As we, as we get beyond the Dongguan Caves to the edge of the Gobi, that is going to take us to Xi'an. Xi'an, as you know, is uh, what it used to be called Shangan. It is the old Sanadu. And it's a huge city. It's a very old city. It's, it's a Chinese city that is very different from the cities of the coast. Probably because it was the one who was always most in contact with the rest of the world. You're going to find that when you're going to Shangan, you're going to see a much, there is a much more cosmopolitan feeling. Of course, you're going to have the, the bell tower, the famous drum tower, the walls of, of Xi'an, incredible cuisine, the famous Xi'an noodles, and um, the Manchurian, the Manchurian hot pot. And you probably know about it. So there's uh, different, different things that are served to you and you cook in a hot pot with different spices. It's actually an old, again, it's very much an old tradition of the nomads and that has been made fancy, but it's the story is that you just take different bitten pieces and you cook them in the hot pot, take them out and you eat them in your bowl. Communal eating, of course. And this is what I wanted to show you of Xi'an and I found very impressive. The, diff the diversity of people, very much what we will call Central Asian people and we will call Chinese people. And um, I spent a lot of time in Xi'an and I found probably the greatest diversity of food, what they call um, um, not just the noodles, but they, eat, they will eat a lot of bread, for instance. There will be a lot of wheat. There will be a cuisine which is very different and then you, from those who have been in China and the coast. And that photograph in the bottom that you will see there, I, I really love the something that I found when traveling in China. The old people seem to have a ball. They are always um, in the parks, dancing, doing Tai Chi, dancing tango, and this was a choral group. And because accommodation is usually very small, people do everything outside. All the parks are full of people doing all different things. And, and Xi'an, especially with all in the park, with all the parks in the world, is very full of that. And, but of course, Xi'an is, there is much more to Xi'an. And the reason you will go to Xi'an is because you will want to go to the Terracotta Warriors. Um, that is 
just outside of is outside of Xi'an. You don't need to go on a special expedition. You can just take a minibus and go there, and you're gonna come to that. This enormous hangar is just one of the tombs that is being uh, they are there for visit. As you can see, um, you will walk around there because, and, and you will see this is all that is being restored and that is being uh, put together. But it's much more. There are actually quite a few hangars of this. And um, if I don't know, it's up to you, but I recommend spending a few days there because it's just man, man blogging. You need to absorb that, you need to look at that. For instance, if you have a chance, I would recommend um, pay a little bit more and try to go into one of the pits when you're gonna see um, the archeologists working and putting the things together. Um, it will give you a complete different sense of what it was at the time because you're gonna be on the actual pit and the place where the things were found, where the things were created. And if you see this, um, oh, get my ugly face there, uh, there, there is a, um, a very special museum next to it where some of the more delicate pieces are like for instance, the chariot in the, in the, in the bottom. Um, you have to see that person, it's, it's incredible. When you think that that was uh, you know, created thousands of years ago and it's still in that shape. But um, if you see in the top there, these are just eight photographs of different soldiers and you can see they are all had different faces. And even more important, look on the corner here and, and, and the bottom. Those are just different ears. They went to that point. Every soldier, every keeper of the king or the emperor is unique. And that is what really, that's why I say, take time, go and look at it, uh, absorb it, enjoy it. Um, some of the faces are also so wonderful. And uh, I really, really um, think that she, uh, the Terracotta Warriors deserve some of your time. And anyway, you can only go back to Xi'an, have wonderful food, go and have a look in the parks, come back the next day and have a little bit of everything. <laughs> and of course, after Xi'an, uh, we are gonna have the road that is gonna take you to Beijing. But Beijing is not part of the Silk Road. So um, I'm not gonna talk about Beijing. I'm sure that if you come from that side to the Silk Road, you will start there in Beijing. It's a wonderful place too, it's very exciting, but Beijing is not part of the Silk Road. It never was. So um, I took you along a little bit, I didn't want to bore you too much about just the most special places that you can travel and visit today in the Silk Road. I'll show you a little bit of the face of the people you're gonna encounter there. But traveling along the, thing, the Silk Road, there were two things. They were terribly, they were everywhere. The most ter terribly popular. I went into poor little villages. I went into big cities. I went into places that were out on the sticks. And I went to places that were the most, the most, the most sought after. And there were two things that I found in the Silk Road. And those were, everywhere I went, I found two elements. Wherever we were, and those, oh, sorry, and those were tea and bread. Tea and the different ways, from the spicy tea of Kashmir and the bottom there, what, they call uh, masala chai, to the powder tea in Japan, to the green tea, to the milk tea, and in the bottom we got uh, the bread of Xi'an, the bread of Istanbul, the bread of Turkey, the bread of Samarkand, and those were the two elements that are found all along the Silk Road. The East brought us, gave us tea we gave them bread. And I think that those two, today very simple uh, elements, um, cheap food, and yet that is the food most shared along the Silk Road. Tea and bread. 
and I hope that um, you enjoyed this and um, and you understood a little bit more because as I say, the Silk Road didn't come to an end. Nothing comes to an end in history, everything is related. Every end is the beginning of, a, of something new and we human beings are very good at that. Sometimes we battle change, sometimes we have problem with it, but we are very inventive and we move forward. And I thank you. Amanda, get us all together, please. Okay, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, and we can put on gallery view. We can see everyone. <laughs> okay, hello. Hello, guys. Hello, and guys. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed. And um, uh, <laughs> thank you. And that it was, um, you know, and it went in any way informative to you people. Thanks very much. It was very interesting. Thank you. I've been there, so I experienced yeah. it. You know, it and that, yes? Any questions? Wonderful, Liliana. Absolutely wonderful. Bravo, so bravo, bravo. Both of them. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Liliana. Uh, it was really interesting. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I got a passion for these things. I got a yeah. passion for these things. You can see but, uh, that. <laughs> you can see yeah, that. Yeah, I, I find it fascinating. Well, I always say I will never be rich because I spend all my money traveling in these places. <laughs> but I think. Yes, uh, it's probably one of the nicest things that we can, you know, that we can share that. And um, and the world is the world is big, and at the same time, it's very small. And um, everything has, keeps on moving. Everything we we, we has changed and is happening. And um, and it's very interesting because when I start putting that, you know, when I was just trying to put the story together, yes, but we have to find another way to get there. But of course, and and the way to get there, hey, we found the Americas, right? So, and that as itself is another huge story, you know. So, um, one thing brings into the other. So, probably I will. Um, uh, there will be story to follow about the Americas and what it happened, you know, from the Incas to the Aztecs to well, to the to the whole other bit. Uh, I will probably work on that, and, and I'll let you know. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.